Well, thanks for joining me today for our presentation. I am Eric Bjornstead, and I am the Technical Information Director of Bell Performance in Central Florida. Uh, today, we want to talk a little bit about the fuel-related problems that large marine diesel engines face as well as the options that are available on the additization side for the fuel oil that's used by those kinds of engines and the large marine ships. Uh, in our time together today, we're going to aim to cover the major considerations that are entailed when we talk about marine fuel oils, their properties, the problems that they cause for the end users, and also the options that we have to serve as the solutions for those problems. So when we address the topic of fuel treatment solutions, we're going to be talking more specifically about things like dispersants stabilizers and combustion catalysts and ash modifiers and corrosion inhibitors. And as we will aim to further see, Bell Performance has effective solutions for both marine heavy fuel oil and marine light diesel fuel. And these are solutions that can address the fuel-related problems that uh, large marine ships face. Uh, these solutions will be ones like ATX 1004 and 1005 SSD, uh, and on the light diesel side, these all life and Bellicide. So let's kick this off by briefly touching on the nature of marine fuel oil and how it contributes to problems in the industry. Now, uh, marine fuel oils created from blending secondary residual fuels with cutter stocks, and that's as depicted by this graphic, you can see that there are a number of different things that can go into marine fuel oil. And the fuel's characteristics, the marine fuel's characteristics, depends on the, uh, the origins of the crude oil that went into it and the kind of refinery processes that are employed to make it. Uh, and marine fuel oil characteristics are important to consider because they impact how the fuel behaves and the problems that the fuel brings with it. Now, uh, when crude oil is processed, it gets split into different classes of products like gasoline and LPG and diesel fuel and the like. Now, some of them are distillate fuels or class are classified as distillate fuels like gasoline and diesel, and uh, the rest of them are classified as residual fuels. Now. And the important thing to consider here is that historically it used to be that you would get 50 to 65 percent of your crude would be uh, distillate fuels, meaning you'd get maybe you know 50 to 35 percent residual. Today it's closer to seven to 10 percent residual, so they're getting a whole lot more distillate fuel out of it uh, and a whole lot less residual. And this fact impacts the characteristics and the properties of both the distillate fuels and also the residual fuels. Now, uh, we can see this by looking at uh, the typical properties of heavy marine fuels that are in use today. Uh, these, these, prop these are all properties that are typically specced when they do a, a fuel analysis for a residual fuel like heavy fuel oil. And you can see that uh, a number of these characteristics are defined, things like density and, and viscosity, sulfur content, ash content, uh, metallic co and inorganic contents like vanadium and sodium and aluminum uh, and silicon. Uh, now, the reason why this is important to consider is because um, the properties of the marine fuel oil, these kinds of things, uh, what these are, how these are defined will influence how that marine fuel performs and will also be a determining factor in how likely the fuel is to cause problems. So it is this likelihood that we need to explore next. So what kind of problems uh, typically can you find with marine fuel oil? Well, uh, because of its nature, because of how it's made, marine fuel oils, or what they might call MFOs, you know, they can tend to be prone to many different kinds of issues, both pre-combustion issues and uh, issues during combustion and then post-combustion issues. And if you've been in the marine industry for any length of time, these are probably, you know, relatively old news for you. Uh, a number of the problems that can be seen typically, you can get a lot of sludge formation in the tanks because of the precipitation of asphaltines out of the fuel. Uh, you can get filter blocking. You can get plugging of centrifuges with excess sludge. You can have problems with poor atomization of fuel, 
you know, poor ignition and poor combustion of the fuel, you can get damage to fuel pumps and piston rings and liners, uh, sometimes because of excessive catalytic fine content in the fuel oil. Uh, you can have an increased frequency of having to change injectors and overhaul pistons. And of course, anytime you have this, this means that it is cutting into and straining uh, you know, the maintenance budget that you might have. You can also have problems with high temperature deposits, uh, erosion of exhaust valves, fouling of a number of different areas like turbocharger nozzle rings and uh, rotor blades, exhaust gas economizers, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and of course, you can also have in by excess environmental pollution and income and even even something as elementary as incompatibility of mixing different kinds of fuel in the tank. Now most of this myriad of problems we just listed off real quickly. Most of these problems stem from the characteristics of the fuel itself. And it should be quite evident, given that we just listed three slides worth of problems, it should be pretty evident that if you are a user of marine fuel oil, you have a lot of different things to contend with. So let's examine a few of these things a little bit more closely. And let's start in the pre-combustion area. Let's look at something like marine fuel oil stability. Now, um, stabi when we talk about stability and we talk about compatibility, uh, the term stability when you're talking about fuel, what you're referring to is the fuel's ability to resist change over time. When you talk about uh, compatibility, you're talking about the ability of, of a fuel or of a substance to remain stable when it is blended. Now, the reason why we bring this up is because problems with instability and problems with incompatibility are related many times to asphaltine presence in the fuel. Now, how is this? Well, um, asphaltines are a natural uh, component of the fuel, natural component of the, the crude oil itself that end up in the, uh, the residual fuels. And typically, they exist in my cell form in the fuel, and they are stabilized by the presence of natural resins. So a, a, a marine fuel or any kind of fuel that is relatively stable will tend to have a high ratio of resins to asphaltines. And the converse is also true, that if you uh, uh, apply some, let's say, some refinery processes like severe vis breaking, and you apply that to fuel in an effort to do something else like increase your yield of, of distillate products. You can create an unstable fuel uh, in, in part because it has a lower resin content because that vis breaking has affected the resin content of that fuel. And when that happens, you create the potential for instability in that fuel. Um, these asphaltines that we're talking about, they typically are pretty large, what would they call macromolecules. They're really large molecules. They have a lot of carbons in them. Um, and as you can see from these, these chemical models, uh, you know, all of these green spheres, these green elements here, those are all carbons. So you can see that a typical asphaltine molecule like this, it's very large. Uh, because it has a lot of carbon content, it tends, it, it, contributes a significant amount of heat energy to the combustion of that fuel. Um, and unfortunately, when uh, the, the fuel is created and when, when the resins are destroyed by refinery processing, when those kind of things happen uh, and these asphaltines become instable and start to drop out of solution, you know, when that happens, you can get a number of different kinds of problems that are manifested on the end user level. Uh, one of those problems is that uh, these asphaltines, if they get disturbed and if they get taken out of their normal stable uh, you know, existence as my cells in the fuel, if, they, if, they, if, if something happens to take them out of their normal stable existence, then what will they will tend to do is they will tend to start bonding together with other asphaltines and they'll start to form polymers in the fuel. Uh, if you remember from chemistry class, a polymer is simply a large molecule that's made up of the bonding together of lots of smaller units. Well, you can get asphaltines that will bond together and form larger and larger and longer and longer polymer chains. And eventually, this shows up as sludge accumulation in the fuel. And when this happens, 
then what you're going to have to do, what what you're going to have to consider in order to uh, in order to solve this kind of problem is you're going to have to consider the use of a dispersant. So dispersants in these cases are pretty necessary in order to prevent sludge dropout. Now, as we said earlier, naturally the fuel will contain these resin components and the resins tend to act as natural dispersants and keep these asphaltines apart, keep them in my cell form and away from each other and naturally stabilized in the fuel. So the use of a dispersant after the fact can a useful thing if you want to continue to keep these asphaltines dispersed and and uh, apart and and stabilized uh, in the fuel itself. Um, if when you use dispersants, the kind of benefits that you can see is you can see uh, a reduced uh, amount of dropout of fuel sludge when that fuel is stored, and you can see less blocking of filters, and you can see a reduced accumulation of sludge in the centrifuges. Now, this reduced all of these problems, whether you're talking about reduced filter plugging, uh, reduced uh, sludge accumulation, you know, this the these ben these two benefits can be pretty significant when you consider the fact that uh, if you don't do anything like this, then fuel sludge, because there are so many different areas in the marine fuel transfer system, which is illustrated on this slide here, because there's so many areas that that, that fuel has to go through, uh, you know, excess sludge dropout and excess asphaltine dropout can cause a lot of problems in a lot of different areas. Um, if you follow the fuel's uh, uh, journey from start to finish, you can see that there are a lot of different areas that excess fuel sludge and asphaltine dropout and asphaltine accumulation, there are a lot of different areas that uh, it can show up in to cause problems, whether you're talking about the transfer pumps, you're talking about different uh, filter areas, separator pumps, preheaters, here are the centrifuges, the settling and the service tanks. Fuel sludge can be in any of these areas. And when you get sludge showing up, it can look like this. Uh, this is an, a, a good pictorial example of just black asphaltine sludge buildup inside of a marine fuel tank. But you can also get it showing up in the places like the centrifuges. You know, uh, marine fuel oil typically, uh, if you saw on that schematic, there was a, an area in the fuel transfer system where the marine fuel oil has to run through a centrifuge and the centrifuge's uh, uh, purpose here is to help try and remove the inorganics and some of the other things that you don't want going in well if you have uh, you know excess asphaltine dropout then that asphaltine dropout is going to end up in places like this and that can be a problem uh, you know it, first of all it can be a problem because if the centrifuge fills up uh, if this is pulling out too much from the fuel, well, then you're going to have to you're going to have to stop. You're going to have to to empty it or to change it. But more importantly, uh, remember that because asphaltines and because these the these these sludge molecules are these very large uh, macromolecules, uh, they have a lot of carbon content and they contribute to a you know they, they contribute a significant amount of heat energy. Well. If that sludge and if those asphaltines are being pulled out of the fuel in places like this, then they are not being burned as part of the fuel. And that means that you're losing fuel volume and you're losing uh, heating value, basically. You're losing part of the energy value that you paid for when you purchased that fuel. And for, for, for some businesses, and especially for marine, uh, the, the marine industry, this can be a fairly significant loss. And given the kinds of margins that we're talking about there, you know, anything like that has the potential to cause problems. So uh, given that these problems exist, what can we do about them? Well, Bell Performance has formulated some fairly effective solutions to help solve these marine fuel stability problems. Um, and uh, these solutions are manifested uh, mainly in the ATX marine treatment line. 
the ATX is Bell Performance's uh, trade name for its series of multifunction treatments for heavy fuel oil. And uh, these treatments are used uh, by basically anybody that uses heavy fuel oil. But specifically for the marine sector, we have a couple of marine ATX formulations that are, are formulated specifically for that industry. And the benefits that they give, uh, you can see here, they, they uh, have components that will reduce asphaltine agglomeration, reduce sludge buildup. It will help uh, train this sludge and re uh, stabilize it back into the fuel so that instead of being pulled out by uh, uh, centrifuges and instead of settling out in storage tanks and in areas in the fuel transfer system, instead it goes where it's supposed to. It ends up being burned with the rest of the fuel. It ends up uh, providing that heating value and providing part of that fuel's value that you paid for. So. After we advance past, after we look past the stability problems, we have to consider some other uh, what we would call pre-combustion issues that marine heavy fuel oil can tend to bring with it for its users. What are these problems? Well, uh, excessive sludge precipitation, we've already covered that. Uh, filter blockage, of course, goes hand in hand with that. And we covered centrifuge overload from sludge. So those, so those three things are things that uh, go into the stability issues that we just talked about. But beyond that, other pre-combustion problems that can be manifested. Well, you can have water, you can have emulsions, uh, either stable emulsions or partial emulsions of water that go hand in hand with heavy fuel oil production. Um, you can have excess catalytic fines in the fuel. Remember that uh, at the refinery, the refineries tend to use uh, certain certain catalysts in order to make these fuels, and sometimes they won't get all of them out. And some of those some some of those 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 catalysts can end up in the fuel, and if they end up going into places they're not supposed to, they can cause problems. Like they can cause, for example, this abrasive wear that we reference here. So catalytic fine content of the fuel and abrasive wear, those can be problems. You can have fouling of the fuel heaters. Definitely fouling of the injector tips can be a problem because that can lead to poor fuel atomization. If the fuel doesn't atomize well, it will not combust, will not burn as well as it should. Um, you can have problems in areas like the viscosity controllers, the heaters, you know, hot fuel filters. You can have fouling of fuel pumps and uh, excess deposits in fuel injectors. So all of these are areas that these pre-combustion problems in marine fuel oil, problems can show up in all of these kinds of areas and in all of these kinds of ways. For example, fuel injectors. A fuel injector is really important in the combustion process because it is the fuel injector that is the last line for delivering the fuel into the combustion zone. And fuel injectors are designed to deliver the fuel uh, in a certain way. They're designed to atomize the fuel and, and turn it into a form, deliver it in a form that makes it most as combustible as, as, as possible, basically. But over time, if you get fouling of those tips, if you get, uh, you might get abrasive wear of those tips from the catalytic fines, you might get a buildup of, of carbonaceous uh, uh, deposit, like you can see with this, uh, injector tip. Uh, if you get this kind of, of, of cauliflower deposit or starburst deposit, anything like that, any of those things, those will affect how that fuel injector is able or not able to inject and atomize and deliver that fuel into the combustion chamber. And so if you have a fuel injector that looks like this, you are not going to get uh, optimal combustion uh, of that fuel. And when that happens, you're, you're not going to get as much work out of that fuel as possible. So how do you solve these problems? Well, Bell Performance has, uh, through its ATX marine line, Bell Performance formulated these, a these marine ATX formulations to provide ingredients that will solve the typical pre-combustion problems for the marine fuel uh, uh, industry. Um, it, they will, uh, uh, the formulations like ATX 1004 DSC, they will stabilize the fuel. They'll disperse existing asphaltines in the fuel. They will improve the efficiency of centrifuging. 
uh, help with the, the filtration dropout. So you get reduced fuel waste. You save fuel because you're, you're, you're getting more of the fuel to do what it was designed to do. Uh, if you use ATX-1000 for DSC or its sister formulation, which is ATX-1005, if you use any of those, you'll improve the centrifuging efficiency. You'll, you'll uh, reduce the uh, catalytic fines that are in the fuel. You'll enhance the atomization of the fuel oil. You'll improve combustion. So all of the already, even if you just consider the pre-combustion issues, uh, there are su some significant value points that Bell Performance Marine ATX formulations will deliver to the end user. But pre-combustion is only one small slice of the pie. Uh, when we consider the whole picture of problems with marine fuel oil, we definitely have to consider the combustion issues that go along with marine fuel oil. Now, in order to understand combustion issues, we have to understand a little bit about combustion basics. Now, the basics are com of combustion is that you take fuel, you mix it with oxygen, and when you burn it, you get heat and water vapor and carbon dioxide. So success in combustion is defined as getting as close to that perfect equation as possible. However, unfortunately, there are things that happen in the real world that prevent that from happening. So how do you, you know, what are these problems? How do you achieve close to perfect and optimal combustion as possible? Well, that is the riddle that every combustion engineer basically is always working towards solving. Now, uh, in order to have optimal combustion, you need to have this mixture of things. You can, you can, you can define it by the acronym MATT. You have to have the proper mixing of air and fuel. You have to have the proper atomization. There's that word again. You have to have proper atomization of the liquid fuels or delivery of the liquid fuels into the combustion zone. You have to have the right temperature of the air uh, of the fuel and the combustion zone. They miss, and you must have the proper temperature because that plays into this part of the, uh, of the equation. And you must have enough time provided to complete the combustion process. So all of these things are important in order to have ideal combustion. Now, what happens when, uh, when, when a, 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 portion of fuel, what happens when a portion or a particle, a droplet of fuel oil uh, is burning? Um, if we understand this, then what we can better understand are both the problems that uh, go into incomplete combustion, but then also we can start to understand a little bit better about the possible solutions. So this is a fuel oil droplet. If you were burning coal, this could be a coal particle. It is a piece of petroleum that is being, uh, being put into proximity with a flame front. The flame front, of course, is going to provide the heat, uh, the heat input that's going to start driving these, these combustion chemical reactions. Now, uh, keep in mind that everything that we're going to discuss here when we go through the three stages of combustion happens in fractions of a microsecond. So this is, uh, th this is basically what happens during combustion. The fuel oil droplet here is, starts to get heated by the flame front, and as it's heated, the volatile elements of it come to the surface and they start to evaporate. And you get this, this, this almost cloud of vapor that's surrounding the fuel oil droplet. Then that cloud of vapor starts to burn. So we say the volatile constituents of the fuel oil. Uh, the volatile constituents of the petroleum, they start to burn, creates a flame that surrounds the droplet. And once those are burned off, what you end up with is you end up with a piece of, shall we say, less flammable carbonaceous substance that's left over. That's called the coke. Now, when the f original flame from the volatiles dies off, this coke is going to continue to burn. Uh, because it still contains carbon, there's still a lot of heat around, there's still oxygen available, so it's going to continue to burn, and it's going to burn at between 1400 and 1700 Kelvin. Um, eventually, when, uh, uh, when, when this process stops, when as much of that carbon is, uh, is burned off as is going to burn off in the allotted amount of time and in the allotted conditions, well, then what you're left with is a, 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 a essentially a piece or a sphere or almost a carcass of unburned coke. 
and that is called a cenosphere. Now, uh, the reason why we're talking about this is this. First of all, uh, if you have poor marine fuel combustion or patrol, poor petroleum combustion in general, uh, what are the things that can contribute to it? Well, as we've said before, if you have poor atomization of the fuel, that can be a contributing factor. Uh, if you have fuel that has poor specifications such that it's what they would call a slow burning fuel, well, that can be, you know, a slow burning fuel can be a fuel that is going to uh, uh, tend to be associated with poor marine fuel, com poor marine fuel combustion, excuse me. Uh, if you have problems with getting the right balance of excess air, such that let's say you're trying, you're a combustion engineer and you're trying to control acid production, which we'll see later on, that can be a, a contributor to poor uh, fuel combustion. Um, other problems you see, piston fouling and depositing can lead to combustion problems. Prem uh, combustion problems itself can contribute to premature piston ring failure, accelerated, uh, uh, accelerated wear of the cylinder liner, and fouling of areas like the scavenge ports and under the pistons. Um, this here is a very large marine piston. You should be able to tell from the scale that this, this is not your ordinary automobile piston. This is a piston of a large marine engine. And what you, the notable thing that you should be able to see here is this displays characteristic signs of fouling that are associated, that are, are associated with poor combustion. Note that the metal surfaces have been compromised up here. Note all of this characteristic damage here. This is, a, a, a definitive sign of piston fouling here. You can also see these kind of deposits from poor combustion. Uh, this is a scavenge port, and scavenge port, of course, is where the exhaust gases are forced out of the cylinder you know, on, on, on a post-combustion level. And uh, if that fuel has poor specifications, if, uh, if, if, if incomplete or suboptimal combustion uh, is the, the order of the day, well, then you can get a uh, buildup of problematic deposits like these. Um, these and other types of deposits are usually fuel-related because this kind of material, these kinds of deposits, uh, they all have to come from the fuel anyway. So given all of these kinds of problems, what are the options for addressing these kinds of problems? Well, uh, the ATX marine formulations from Bell Performance are formulated with combustion catalysts that aim to remediate these kinds of problems. You know, any kind of solution, any good solution that you're proposing to solve suboptimal combustion, well, uh, you, you're, you're, you're going to want them to be able to impact how the marine fuel behaves in a number of ways. Um, they're going to uh, need to provide earlier completion of the combustion process, which results in less soot being formed. Uh, you're going to want them to enhance oxygen transport during that coke combustion phase. Remember that. Um, and you're going to want it to be able to provide cleaner fuel injectors and, and cleaner pistons and keep your valves free of carbon deposits. Now, if you use a combustion catalyst, then you can start to see uh, things like this. The ATX marine treatments from Bell Performance contain a, a family of combustion catalysts that research has shown can significantly improve the combustion of petroleum fuels under any kind of conditions. Uh, the research on this kind of thing was done in the 1950s, and what they found was that there were certain kinds of metals, what they would call organometallic catalysts, there were certain kinds of metals that showed uh, the potential to be able to improve the combustion of petroleum fuels. And what they also found, as they continued to explore this a little further, is that they could take combinations of these combustion catalysts and they would have a synergistic effect so that if one of them was good, three of them would be more than three times better, so to speak. And Bell Performance's 1000, uh, ATX 1004 DSC and 1005 SSD both contain combustion catalysts that significantly improve this area. And when they're used, you can see things like this. Now, this one on the, on the left, this is one of those cenospheres. And this is from an untreated fuel. This is from petroleum that did not have a combustion catalyst in it. You can see that it is a particle of coke. Remember that. 
uh, you can see a few holes in here because this is an electron micrograph, so it's very, very high magnification. But this is basically what a particle of unburned or partially burned fuel looks like. In fact, this is basically what a particle of soot looks like. Now, when you treat the same fuel oil with a combustion catalyst, this is what you end up with. What you see is that uh, this, this has been hollowed out. This used to be this. So you've, got, you've had a lot more of this carbon has been burned. And instead of a, a solid particle of carbon, basically, what you have essentially is a shell. So this fuel here that was treated with the combustion catalyst provided more heat energy and had more uh, uh, or, or greater level of combustion, so to speak, than this fuel uh, uh, did. So you can see that there is a, a significant difference. Now, if we measure that difference, I mean, you saw visually what the difference was when you bef when, with before and after a combustion catalyst. But when you start measuring these, you can, see, you, you can start to see some pretty significant improvements here. Uh, this, the, the, this graph is uh, when they took some marine fuel oil. And first, they, they, they burned it under controlled conditions. Uh, and the untreated fuel, well, when, they were, when combustion was finished, they measured the unburned carbon, and you had about 1.35, almost 1.4% unburned carbon. They take the same fuel, they add an iron combustion catalyst, and what you can see is that unburned carbon was reduced by about 60%. Same as when they used the calcium combustion catalyst. And when they took that iron catalyst and they used it with a dispersant as well, they got an even bigger reduction, to 66% reduction. When they take the combination of uh, organometallic combustion catalysts that are in the ATX-1005 formulation, they got an 88% reduction in unburned carbon. So use of combustion catalysts in marine shipping fuel should give you know, pretty positive benefits for the, for the customer, including a better fuel efficiency because you're having more complete combustion of that fuel. So the third major kind of problem that marine fuel oils that you might be seeing are what we would term post-combustion uh, uh, problems. And by this, we mean problems with corrosion in both high and low temperature areas. Now, high temperature corrosion, that's a term that you hear a lot. And what that refers to is corrosion damage that occurs in the combustion zone, which is, of course, the area where the highest temperatures are. And uh, if you have high temperature corrosion, you can see problems like this. This is a piston crown which exhibits obvious signs of hot corrosion damage. And this hot corrosion damage was most definitely fuel related. Here, this is another uh, a picture of some typical piston crown. Again, fuel related. Now, uh, on these exhaust valves and on the nozzle rings, you can see further damage, which was caused by corrosion. And that corrosion came from elements that were pre-existing in the marine fuel oil. So uh, why can we say that high temperature corrosion is fuel related? Well, it is fuel related because um, fuel contains inorganics like vanadium and sodium and other kinds of metals. And during combustion, these these inorganics uh, uh, oxidize with the available oxygen and they form different kinds of deposits. And depending on the composition of those deposits, they have different melting points and they can be more or less corrosive to metal surfaces. Now, this graph here uh, uh, can show you that the melting point of the what we would call the complexes that are formed uh, can be dependent on things like the ratio of, let's say, vanadium content and sodium content in the metal, uh, excuse me, in the, in, the, in the fuel oil. And the reason why this matters is because if you have deposits like in this range here that have low melting points compared to deposits that are in this range here, which have higher melting points, these kinds of deposits here, the low, uh, a low melting point deposits, so to speak, these are more likely to be damaging in the high temp, the, the hot temperature zone uh, of a of, of an engine that burns marine fuel oil. 
Um, basically how they form is that these inorganics like vanadium and sodium, they form these, uh, the, these oxide complexes and they tend to start binding to the metal surfaces. They do things like they flux with, uh, with iron and things like that. And they start to react on metal surfaces. They start to, uh, other ash particles to make the uh, deposits larger and they corrode and they damage these metal surfaces. And this is a serious problem for marine fuel oil users. So what are the best practices to combat this problem? Well, the traditional solution for corrosion from heavy fuel oil, and that's whether it's marine heavy fuel oil or uh, you know, non-marine heavy fuel oil, the traditional solution has been to add magnesium into the fuel. And this has always been highly effective at combating corrosion problems because magnesium does a couple of different things. First thing it does is it modifies the composition of these, the, what we'll say call these ash deposits. It modifies their composition and it increases their melting point. And if you remember, higher melting point deposit means it will be less corrosive and less damaging. But magnesium also acts as an excellent acid neutralizer. It, uh, the magne and a magnesium oxide, for example, if you add that into the combustion zone, then it will combine with SO3 that has been formed in during combustion. And instead of possibly leading to the formation of sulfuric acid, instead what you'll get is you'll get a combining of these two things and you'll get magnesium sulfate, which is pretty well innocuous and neutral. So uh, magnesium has been used uh, in in this respect for decades. Uh, it's it's always been highly uh, highly effective and it's been used long enough that they know pretty well uh, how much magnesium they need in order to prevent problems in any kind of fuel oil. Um, in fact, uh, what they will typically find is for every molecule of V2O5, which is a very common uh, vanadium complex that's formed. If you add three parts of magnesium, then what you'll get is you'll get a large molecule here, 3MgO V2O5. But the key thing about this versus this is that the melting point has been increased from 675 to 1190. That's over a 500 degrees increase. This is going to be a lot less problematic in the, the hot temperature zone than this will be. So magnesium traditionally is what they use to solve corrosion problems. Now, what about low temperature corrosion? Well, low temperature corrosion is what tends to manifest itself when you have the uh, uh, SO3 being formed which then combines with water and forms sulfuric acid. And this, this whole, whole process right here, this is a tremendous problem for users of heavy fuel oil. And the reason this is a problem is because when sulfuric acid is formed in these kinds of situations, it eventually, uh, uh, as, as it forms in the, uh, the, the, the exhaust gas stream. And as the exhaust gas leaves the combustion zone and it travels, you know, towards the exhaust area, it cools down. And eventually, you have the possibility that any acid vapor that's been formed in it will condense out on the surfaces and cause major corrosion issues. And so, you know, the operator, this is enough of a concern that the operator has a big problem here because the operator wants to be, first of all, be as efficient as possible. They want to get as close to maximum combustion efficiency as possible but they also want to prevent low temperature corrosion problems from happening. And the problem with this kind of thing is that if you do, if you do one thing to improve one side, you'll have an increase in the other side and vice versa. So uh, the, the, the operator faces a challenge. They face a dilemma basically to try and maximize their efficiency while minimizing their corrosion problems. Um, so, you know, what is that operator going to do? Well, there's no easy solution to this. Um, you know, if they, if they try to minimize corrosion problems by, let's say, reducing the amount of oxygen that's supplied for combustion, which is one thing you can do, well, then if you don't supply enough oxygen, then you're going to get less than optimal combustion. So you've, in order to solve one problem, 
you have cut into, you know, the other side of what you wanted to do. So it, it, it can tend to be a big problem. And there are a lot, but uh, when we're talking about solving corrosion, it is a serious enough problem that the operator really has to try and meet the challenge because corrosion, whether it's hot corrosion or whether it's cold end corrosion, there can be a lot of areas that can be prone to corrosion damage. And you can, you know, if, if you're in the industry, you know this very well, you know, exhaust valves and piston crowns. You know, we saw pictures of that hot corrosion damage there. And on the cold end side, all the exhaust cold end system, the valve casings and trunking and economizers, you know, you can have corrosion damage in all of those areas. So rhetorical question is how much do corrosion problems cost the marine industry? Uh, you know, it, it's a fairly sizable chunk. You know, this is an exhaust valve that was damaged by a cold end corrosion. Um, you know, you can have uh, corrosion damage to turbochargers tur and turbochargers you know, in marine ships are really, really large and expensive pieces of, of, of equipment. Um, uh, since a turbocharger uses exhaust air to help drive the machinery, if you have high acid levels in that exhaust air, then you are going to have corrosion damage to that turbocharger. Uh, you can get damage that looks kind of like this. You can have damage to the economizers. Uh, this is uh, obviously significant corrosion damage that happened in this. And so this piece of equipment is going to have to be uh, repaired and replaced. Um, if you use a magnesium additive, like the magnesium ingredients that are in ATX 1004 uh, DSC and 1005 SSD, if you use those, you can prevent problems like this. You can prevent corrosion damage and you can prevent problematic buildup of, of, of deposits in areas like this. In fact, if you use magnesium treatment, your economizer can look more like this than this. This is a, an economizer out of a ship that was built in 1993, and it used magnesium at treatment in its marine fuel oil. And this is what the economizer in that ship looked like. Note the tremendous difference between this and this. So magnesium treatments are really, really effective at preventing uh, both hot and cold end corrosion and deposit problems. And the ATX marine formulations like 1004 DSC, they contain fuel-soluble magnesium. Now, we, uh, this magnesium fixes both high temperature corrosion problems because it changes the melting points of the deposits, and it fixes low temperature corrosion problems because it neutralizes, it has a neutralizing effect of that acid. Now, um, the one thing that we want to point out here is that uh, the difference between what we call fuel soluble magnesium and the traditional magnesium that has been used in times in the past. Um, if you're in the industry, you probably know of the use of what they call MAGOX. MAGOX is just simply MGO, it's magnesium oxide. Uh, magnesium oxide is readily available, it's, it's essentially the commodity item. Um, and is readily and very inexpensively available as uh, a slurry form. And it used to be that you could take a magnesium oxide slurry and you could pump, you'd have a tank and you could pump it into your fuel oil and that is what you would use. But the problem is that this kind of magnesium oxide slurry, it's not what we call fuel soluble. It's insoluble in fuel. And so it causes operational problems. It may get the job done as far as solving corrosion issues, but it's really, I mean, it's nasty to work with. It builds up, uh, it settles out a lot, and operators really don't like using it. But the, uh, the, the, the Bell Marine ATX formulations contain fuel-soluble magnesium, which does not uh, contribute to this kind of problem. It's a lot easier to use for the operator, operators really like using the kind of magnesium that's in the Bell ATX formulations versus the old magnesium oxide formulations. So if you use ATX 1004 DSC or 1005 SSD, what kind of benefits are you going to see? Well, you're going to see benefits 
like these. You're going to see reductions in ash and reductions in carbon buildup in areas. You're going to see uh, reduced unburned carbon all around because of the catalyst, the combustion catalyst metals. You're going to see cleaner economizers. Uh, you're going to you're, you're, you're going to see a significant improvement in the surface intervals for economizers because they're not going to need to be cleaned as often. Um, you're going to have a reduction in unburned carbon in deposits in areas of the engine, less engine wear. Uh, again, we already said better economizer cleanliness, definite reductions in low and high temperature corrosion, which is a huge, huge benefit for for operators. Uh, better fuel stability, reduced sludge formation, and of course, elimination and dispersion of water and moisture while the fuel is in storage. Um, one, both 1004 DSC and SSD are typically, uh, the recommended dosage is, starts out at between one to 3,000 and one to 4,000. And then usually the operator will keep track of their performance parameters and they will adjust up or down accordingly. Uh, the one exception to this is if you, if, if there is a marine fuel oil that has, according to its fuel specifications, let's say excess vanadium or sodium content. Um, in that case, you want to be sure to get it as, uh, the, the required amount or the necessary amount of magnesium in there. And so, uh, Bell Performance typically in these kinds of situations will uh, provide recommendations for its customers on an alternate treat ratio to start out with. Uh, how do you dose 1000 for DSC? Well, uh, any fuel additive that's going on a marine ship needs to slot in seamlessly with the ship's, uh, with the ship's setup. So typically, uh, there is a, a storage tank for it, and typically it is directly into the settling tank or even directly into the fuel stream by use of an injection system. That tends to be the easiest way to do it. Now, the sister formulation 1005 SSD, 1005 differs a little bit in that it does not actually contain magnesium. It is really skewed more towards the combustion catalyst and combustion improvement end. And so in that respect, the benefits that 1005 SSC provides are things like better optimal combustion of the HFO, reduction of unburned carbon, increased fuel efficiency, and of course, it has the sludge dispersant uh, and stabilization package to remove sludge and stabilize the fuel and also disperse and eliminate water. So 1004 DSC and 1005 SSD are the marine HFO formulations from Bell Performance. Now, um, on the light marine diesel side, uh, uh, real briefly, um, when we're looking at the light marine diesel fuels that ships use, the treatment needs really come down to uh, preserving that fuel while it's waiting to be used. So it really comes down to stabilization and keeping mechanical problems at bay. And for those problems, Bell Performance has these all life fuel stabilizer, and then also uh, Bellicide uh, fuel microbicide. Now, fuel stabilizers function to preserve fuel quality in essence by stopping chemical reactions in the fuel. And these all life is a highly effective package of five different types of stabilization ingredients that when used together, they'll prevent the fuel from aging, prevent it from forming sludge, keep it from darkening, reduce the potential for black smoke formation because of sludge combustion, and inhibit rust formation. Uh, these all life as a fuel stabilizer is highly effective at de deactivating oxidizing metals, um, reducing sludge formation, dispersing water, and reducing filter plugging because of varnish and shellac deposits. The base treat rate for these all life, um, the main formulation has a, a treat rate of one to 2000. Uh, we do have a 1 to 5,000 concentration, which is what we call an RB formulation, which is reserved for bulk fuel treatment. And then the other product for light marine fuel oil is Bellicide. Bellicide is a broad spectrum biocide, kills all the, the broad spectrum of my, common microbes that are found in fuel. Um, uh, typically, um, anytime that you have water that's present, you can have microbial activity in fuel, which can be really, really problematic over time. So it's especially important for marine fuel 
users to keep that fuel free of microbes, and that is what Bellicide does. It is probably the fastest bacterial kill in the industry and the longest lasting with continuous protection of up to four weeks. It's very, very highly effective uh, and performs very well compared to other competing biocide chemistries. It's fully combustible, does not form hazardous byproducts or combustion residues. Uh, it's non-corrosive. It's stable. Uh, it's stable long term, so it has a long shelf life, so to speak. It's not emulsifying, and it prevents microbially induced corrosion and microbial induced biodegradation, so to speak, of stored diesel fuels. So, those are the solutions has for keeping marine fuel, uh, keeping its quality preserved and ready for use. Uh, so now you should be at least a little bit more familiar with the problems that you're likely to be facing if you're in the marine industry, but just as importantly, what are the solutions that are available to you? So we hope that we've been able to increase your understanding at least a little bit about, uh, about what Bell Performance has in that area and why the Bell Performance solutions are the ones that you should consider uh, if this is a problem in your area. So if you have any questions about this, uh, my email address is here. It's ebjornstad at bellperformance.net. Please send me an email. Uh, let me know that you, you, you saw this, this presentation. You have some questions. Uh, I will be very happy to help you in whatever way that I can. So uh, that has been our presentation today on marine heavy fuel oil and uh, problem solving treatment solutions for the end users. My name is Eric Bjornstad with Bell Performance. I'll see you next time. Bye.